Douglas MacArthur always knew that one day he would tower in bronzed honor over the hallowed plain at West Point. Ego ran through him as abundantly as the thunderous talent of the family that bred it. His great-great-grandmother, Sarah Belcher, was a common ancestor, not just of Douglas MacArthur, but of Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt as well. His father, Arthur MacArthur, as a young officer in the Union Army, won the Medal of Honor, storming Missionary Ridge in the Battle of Chattanooga. He would go on to attain the U.S. Army's then highest rank, yet his son would outrace him in both rank and decorations for heroism. Douglas MacArthur probably had the longest and the most profound influence on American military history of any general of the 20th century. He's a second lieutenant in the Philippine insurrection at the turn of the century. He's the chief of staff of the U.S. Army in the early 1930s. He becomes a field marshal for the Philippine government in 1940. Then he becomes the defender of the Philippines, ultimately leads the U.S. Army to the liberation of the Philippines in 1945, and is going to take on responsibility for the invasion of Japan. Following the Japanese surrender, he becomes what amounts to a proconsul in Japan. He actually governs Japan. And then, of course, in 1950, he conducts the most outstanding military maneuver of his career with the invasion of Incheon. No military leaders, with the exception of Washington, had the great pull with the American public that MacArthur did. President Roosevelt would say, Douglas, I think you're our best general, but I believe you would be our worst politician. President Truman would call him Mr. Prima Donna Brass Hat Five Star MacArthur. In the end, Douglas MacArthur would be brought down because he would not stop giving voice to a soldier's central belief. There is no substitute for victory. Douglas MacArthur's father was the son of a Minnesota governor. His brilliant military career would set lofty goals for his son as a soldier. The family's motto, dating back to ancient Scotland, was with faith and by work, which they followed rigorously. Their battle cry was, listen, oh listen, which they never did. At a Mardi Gras ball in Union-held New Orleans, the dashing Arthur MacArthur met and fell in love with beautiful 22-year-old Mary Pinckney Hardy, known as Pinky. They were married in Norfolk, Virginia in 1875. Douglas arrived on January 26, 1880 at Fort Dodge, Arkansas, the last of three children. Growing up on grimy frontier outposts, he would later write that his first memory was that of a bugle call. MacArthur and his brother were probably the only kids at a lot of these posts. And it was a very isolated existence. A small post, very little cultural life, uh, and so it was a very rough beginning. What that did was to create an extremely tight family. The inspired tutoring of his parents was far more important to MacArthur's education than was his rough public schooling. His father held a law degree, hungrily studied world affairs and economics, and encouraged his son to read voluminously. Many people have written that the central focus was his mother, Mary MacArthur. But in my estimation, uh, Arthur MacArthur is uh, the centerpiece of MacArthur's life. Very early on, Arthur MacArthur told his son Douglas, never take counsels of your fear. And he also told him, never uh, hold counsels of war, because they will only bring timidity. Young Douglas, after a distinguished stint at West Texas Military Academy, where he excelled at both academics and sports, entered West Point in 1899 and found both the institution and the career that he had been born to love. In these gray walls, he felt the ghosts of Lee and Grant and stirred to the spirit of the long gray line that had dedicated not just a life, but a soul to the sacred West Point tenets of duty, 
honor, country. Again and again he would return here to refresh his dedication to that creed. There's one incident where he'd had a 17-hour fatigue duty during his summer beast barracks, came back, the upperclassmen had him do exercises in broken glass until he basically passed out and went into convulsions. Sensing Douglas's tribulations, Mary did all a doting mother could. She took up residence on the West Point grounds at Craney's Hotel, from whose windows she could see the light in her son's room. She kept up his spirits with surprise treats. She would bake pastries and cookies and hide them in the cannons at Trophy Point for Douglas to find when he went outside. With her son having grown to a dashing, handsome six-footer, Mary had a full-time job protecting him from romantic entanglements. At one point, he was engaged to several women at the same time and often left it to his mother to terminate the excess relationships. She was no prude. And Mrs. MacArthur would often set up uh, meetings, not just for Douglas, but with other cadets, with some of the girls in Trainee's Hotel, and then act as a lookout. In 1903, to no one's surprise, MacArthur not only graduated at the top of his class, but did so with a great average surpassed by only two others in academy history, one being Robert E. Lee. As a young engineering officer, he was sent to the Philippine Islands where his father had been a hard fighter and benevolent administrator during the Philippine insurrection. Douglas fell in love with the islands that would shape his passion and career all his life. This man is a warrior. Uh, in 1903, his first posting in the Philippines, he was an engineer then, uh, uh, building, uh, working on a construction site, when a crew that he was with was jumped by two insurgents. MacArthur whipped out his pistol, shot both of them dead immediately. In 1904, the Japanese Empire went to war with Tsarist Russia. Arthur MacArthur was sent as a military observer. And he took with him as his aide on this assignment, a young officer just out of West Point, Lieutenant Douglas MacArthur, his son. And from that experience, they lived with the Japanese military and were exposed to the Japanese system politically and civilly, as well as militarily. He developed a great understanding of Japan, the importance of the emperor and the emperor system, and the unique character of the Japanese society. Arthur MacArthur, who was forced from service for his rebellious ways, died in 1912 while speaking at a Civil War reunion. His body was covered by the flag he had carried to the top of Missionary Ridge. Douglas would write, my whole world changed that night. Never have I been able to heal the wound in my heart. By 1917, the Mexican Revolution, led by Pancho Villa, had spilled across the United States border and a punitive expedition under General John J. Pershing pursued hostile forces into Mexico. MacArthur, now a captain, resumed his propensity to go where the trouble was and shoot fast when he got there. He was in Veracruz and on a nighttime reconnaissance well into Mexican territory on a railroad, spent one night there and was attacked three different, on three different occasions. Uh, as the people, the witnesses that were there indicated that MacArthur dropped seven of the Mexican bandits or soldiers, whoever they were, uh, that he encountered. Finally, there was a war big enough to show what MacArthur could do. As a major, then a colonel, he served on the general staff in the new Bureau of Information. Here he would show a public relations genius that would sell the new draft act to America and gain him self-promotional skills he would never lose. His mother promoted him tirelessly as well, writing to Pershing that it was my heart's great wish that you might see your way clear to bestow upon him a star. As the fighting in France intensified, 
MacArthur would quickly fight his way to where the blood flowed fastest and where he could take the family name to new heights of military glory. In July 1918, Douglas MacArthur was promoted to Brigadier General and took command of the 84th Brigade in France. For him, that meant leading from its head, not its rear. MacArthur felt like he had to set the standard. He had to be an extraordinarily brave man. He had to show the troops that. They were green troops. And MacArthur felt like if there was an action, he had to be there. If they were going over the top, he would go over the top with them. He even did his fighting with style, wearing into battle a long muffler knitted by his mother and jutting a cigarette holder. He led nighttime patrols deep into no man's land. He gloried in the bloodiest assignments. He was gassed and almost blinded. When ordered to take strongly defended Châtillon, he responded theatrically with, if this brigade does not capture Châtillon, you can publish a casualty list of the entire brigade with the brigade commander's name at the top. At 38, MacArthur commanded 26,000 men and was the winner of seven silver stars and a chest full of other decorations. His staff gave him a cigarette case inscribed to the bravest of the brave. When the war ended in 1918, Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur found himself with little to do in a tragically shrinking army, but he had too much talent to let it lie fallow. I was told by the chief of staff of the army, General Peyton March, that West Point, the military academy, was 40 years behind the times and that uh, MacArthur would be the superintendent of the academy, and he was given a simple mission to revitalize and revamp the military academy. Some people consider MacArthur the father of the modern military academy because of the things that he instituted, and, and again, at this time of crisis. He brought back the four-year curriculum. He added more uh, humanities and social science courses. He had seen officers who were not prepared to deal with the American soldier, and he felt that the curriculum at West Point should prepare cadets not only to be physically fit, but also to be mentally and socially prepared to deal with the citizen soldiers they would be leading. Mary MacArthur was about to lose her comfortable quarters in the superintendent's house on the West Point grounds. Her always watchful eye at last faltered. One evening, Douglas met socialite Louise Brooks at a club and quickly became engaged. Louise's stepfather was worth millions, and the austere MacArthur married her on Valentine's Day, 1922, at a luxurious Palm Beach estate. She was a very self-confident, outspoken woman, uh, and uh, according to some accounts, uh, she uh, sometimes criticized uh, MacArthur's uh, sexual performances, which uh, probably didn't uh, endear her to the general. Louise's sense of boredom wasn't helped when MacArthur went back to the Philippines as commander of the military district of Manila. The marriage ended in divorce in 1929. Having risen rapidly through the ranks during the 1920s, MacArthur's brilliance was again recognized in 1930 when he became the Army's youngest ever chief of staff at the age of 50. But the army he ran was an underfunded shadow of its former self. When Franklin Roosevelt became president, MacArthur, with more fire than discretion, demanded a budget increase. And basically looked at the president, looked him directly in the eye, and uh, told the president what he thought, told him that in case of the next war, when an enemy soldier had his foot on the chest of uh, an American boy and a bayonet at his throat, he wanted the boy's last threat and last curse, not to be MacArthur, but Roosevelt. The president of me looked at him and says, uh, Douglas, you can't talk to me that way. MacArthur immediately apologized. They left the White House, and as MacArthur tells it, as soon as he left the White House, he vomited on the steps of the White House. In 1932, several thousand veterans of the Great War marched into Washington to demand government bonuses. Many moved into a shantytown across the bridge in Anacostia Flats. 
The handful of communist agitators among them loomed large in MacArthur's mind. And when violence broke out and the army was ordered against the veterans, he thought he saw a threat graver than the civilian authorities could be trusted to deal with. The president, Secretary of War, ordered him to stop at the bridge. MacArthur refused to listen to these messages and went on and drove them out of the, uh, the little shack city where they were. As would be the case in other insubordinate actions during his long military career, he expected no repercussions, and there were none. On the Asian mainland, with the Japanese becoming more and more aggressive, and MacArthur's stint as the Army's chief of staff ending, FDR responded to the Philippines' call for a heavyweight military advisor in 1935 by sending him to build an army and defenses. MacArthur was pleased. Never shy about his image, he owned 23 uniforms and changed three times a day. His Philippines chief of staff was an exceptional young major named Dwight Eisenhower. The match was not made in heaven. The Eisenhower felt offended because MacArthur, as usual, probably didn't give him a whole lot of credit. He never gave his subordinates very much credit. In their latter years, MacArthur would classify Eisenhower as the best clerk that he ever had. Douglas MacArthur lost his last treasured emotional mooring when his mother died of a cerebral embolism shortly after arriving in the Philippines with her son. To honor her memory, the mourning general kept her suite at the Manila Hotel sealed and unoccupied for an entire year. On the voyage to Manila, MacArthur had met Jean Marie Faircloth, a hazel-eyed 37-year-old Tennessean whose lively spirit towered above her tiny 5-foot-2-inch, 100-pound frame. They were married on April 30th, 1937. A son, Arthur, was born in February 1938. MacArthur would prove to be a doting parent who lavished gifts and attention on the boy. Having retired from the Army in December 1937, MacArthur continued his ineffectual role as Field Marshal of the woefully unready Philippine Army. The Japanese Army, meanwhile, continued to slash through China in a brutal war of aggression. In September 1940, Tokyo entered into the Tripartite Pact with Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy. By 1941, Hirohito's forces were moving into Indochina in a way so nakedly expansionist that President Roosevelt froze Japanese assets in the U.S. and declared an oil embargo. Then he brought MacArthur back to active duty as commander of U.S. Army forces in the Far East. But due to the vacillating leadership of Philippine President Manuel Quezon, and the uncertainty by the United States that the Philippines, 8,000 miles from San Francisco and 1,000 from Nagasaki, should be defended. The island's war plans were an indecisive shambles. In the event of attack, the most realistic plan called for a retreat into the Bataan Peninsula near Manila to await reinforcements from America. The war that exploded with the attack on Pearl Harbor left the Philippines unscathed for many hours. MacArthur had ample time to get ready, even to strike counterblows. But the American fighters and bombers bunched wingtip to wingtip against saboteurs at Clark Field and lacking air cover were virtually wiped out on the ground. There is no convincing explanation I think if it were anyone else but MacArthur that this disaster happened to, they might have been promptly relieved. Within 24 hours of the Pearl Harbor attack, Japanese forces landed in the Philippines and began moving toward Manila. When he made the quick decision to withdraw to Bataan, it wasn't time to bring all these supplies, food and medicine back to Bataan, and so they 
shortage of food and medicine on Bataan was a critical factor in losing the battle. Although his side-slipping retreat into the Bataan Peninsula from a Japanese pincers closing in from both north and south was a masterpiece of military maneuver, MacArthur knew that help would never come in time. Directing the battle from Corregidor in Manila Bay, he suspected that he and his forces were doomed. And perhaps his wife and son as well. The invading Japanese, who had driven MacArthur's unprepared, ill-equipped troops down the Philippines for a last stand at Bataan, now tried desperately to overrun them. General Masaharu Homa had been ordered to take the Philippines in 60 days, but for 121 days of slaughter, the defensive ferocity of Bataan's 80,000 starving defenders held the Japanese at bay along the peninsula's 25-mile length. At his headquarters on Corregidor, MacArthur couldn't bear to face his men in the field. Knowing that they had been abandoned by their Washington leaders, he seldom visited the Bataan Front. He had picked up a, a, a nickname from his troops of being dug out dug. That, that happened on Bataan and Corregidor. Uh, but his position was quite different in World War II than it had been in World War I. The truth was that he refused to take refuge in his protected command post deep inside Corregidor's Malinta Tunnel. He relentlessly exposed himself to the dangers outside, having calmly resolved to die with his men. Since he was the only general fighting the Japanese steamroller to a standstill, Roosevelt realized that it would be a disaster to home front morale if the nation's only hero were captured or killed. MacArthur would be rescued by PT boat and plane. Navy Lieutenant John Bulkley's tiny plywood craft carrying the MacArthur family away from Corregidor on the evening of March 11, 1942, ran on tired engines. Any Japanese warship could have run them down. We no sooner got out, we saw about seven miles ahead, pointing north, towards the Corregidor, a Japanese cruiser. And I said, oh my God, this guy, that, this is tragic. However, I immediately turned hard right into the sun, then they never saw us. MacArthur made it all the way, 560 miles through to Australia, and America rejoiced. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. His new headquarters answered the telephone, hello, this is Bataan. MacArthur arrived in uh, uh, Australia in, in March of 1942 at a, at a very down time. Uh, Australian forces uh, were in the Middle East. There was only one division, uh, one Australian division, and only 25,000 U.S. troops in Australia. And for all that they knew, the Japanese were coming to Australia next. Uh, as soon as he hit the ground, he was asked a question by a reporter uh, what he intended to do, and in a somewhat offhand remark, he said, well, I've come through from the Philippines and I shall return. That was picked up immediately worldwide. On May 6, 1942, the Japanese overwhelmed the last of Corregidor's defenders. The survivors from Bataan had already been herded to prison on an atrocity-filled death march. Now, Japan saw its goals in the Pacific as having been too modest. By going after Port Moresby on New Guinea, they could gain a staging base to take Fiji, New Caledonia, and Samoa, effectively cutting off Australia from the American supply line. But when a Japanese attempt to invade Port Moresby by water was beaten back in the Battle of the Coral Sea, they decided to try again, this time overland, across the spiny backbone of New Guinea. Soon MacArthur's scant American forces had joined the hard-fighting Australians in attempting to hold back the Japanese advance while pushing for bases on New Guinea's northern coast. Although August landings in the Solomons diverted some pressure, 
American losses on New Guinea were heavy. One thing Douglas MacArthur did, as well as any general, is he learned. And he starts to realize that he can bypass Japanese garrisons and avoid coming up against their strongest defenses. And his trifibious warfare, as he called it, with the air and land and sea forces. He was brilliant in the way that he designed his campaigns to bypass uh, key enemy fortifications to avoid going into the teeth of their main defenses. While other West Point generals had been trained to see water as an obstacle, MacArthur elected to view it as a highway to bring his forces to the enemy. As his logistical support grew, he leapfrogged ever greater distances across New Guinea's northern coast. MacArthur was the first Allied commander of World War II to move an entire regiment by air and then support it by parachute. He was an intuitive commander who followed his instincts, his emotions. If the intelligence he received from his subordinates contradicted his plans, he went ahead with them anyway. Back home, his heroics were building his fame. His name began appearing on streets, airports, bridges, and ballparks. Early as 1942, there was a move to draft MacArthur for the presidency to run possibly in the, as a Republican candidate against the Democrat uh, Roosevelt. And in fact, many of his staff officers in, the, uh, in Australia and in New Guinea actually worked for uh, MacArthur's uh, candidacy. Through all the fighting, the Japanese had waited with their most powerful forces in their base at Rabaul on New Britain Island. To their raging frustration, MacArthur's bypassing operations left it to wither on the vine. It's one of the most brilliant military campaigns of World War II. With minimal losses, he isolates more than 180,000 Japanese, opens the way for his long desired return to the Philippines. He hungers to stand again on Bataan, growling, until we lift our flag from its dust, we stand unredeemed before mankind. In July 1944, in a personal plea to President Roosevelt, Douglas MacArthur overcame all suggestions of bypassing the Philippines for a more direct thrust at Japan through the Central Pacific, citing strategic, moral, and political necessity as only he could. Roosevelt was persuaded. On October 20th, 1944, American forces made successful landings on the island of Leyte. MacArthur waded ashore and proclaimed at this peak moment of his life that he had indeed returned. Just as he had predicted at the invasion planning sessions, the Imperial fleet came out for a showdown battle to destroy his beachhead and was itself destroyed. Some would claim that the months of vicious fighting for Leyte and Luzon cost too many lives for the strategic value of the Philippines. But if the first objective of war is to destroy the enemy, the hundreds of thousands of Japanese casualties wrought by MacArthur's troops more than justified the American losses. In the battle for Manila, he again and again thrust himself forward to the edge of the fighting. He entered a building in a combat zone, taking no heed of the fears of his aides. I said, General, we better get out of this room. There are two Japanese machine guns pointing right at it. I was the last man out of that room, and I don't think I'd gone five steps before they let loose, and you could hear the room being riddled. One day, when I woke up, he said, we're going down to Bataan today. I see that the old flagstaff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down. Old glory was again raised over Bataan and Corregidor 
and MacArthur at last knew the revenge and vindication that he had yearned after for two and a half bitter years. Selected to lead the land invasion of Japan, slated for November 1st, 1945, he was deep in planning when the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and then Nagasaki signaled the end of the war. He now stood at the pinnacle of glory, having turned the bitterest of defeats into the sweetest of victories. He arrived without sidearms at Tokyo's Atsugi Airport with 300,000 armed Japanese troops within marching distance. On September 2nd, 1945, he presided over the surrender proceedings on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. Only MacArthur had the towering stature needed to serve as supreme commander in Japan. The Japanese expected the worst to happen. They expected the emperor to be somehow disposed of. They expected all sorts of punitive measures taken against the population. And this, of course, never happened. MacArthur was certainly one of the central figures in the decision to retain Emperor Hirohito after the war. MacArthur understood his value as a figurehead in the occupation. He could be used to lubricate the gears of the occupation. One of the reasons that the Japanese came to respect and, and many of them venerate MacArthur is they just superimposed him as a new emperor. He is the one who had, if not displaced, at least humanized Hirohito with that famous picture of MacArthur towering over Hirohito when they had their meeting in 1945. And for the Japanese, it was very easy to say, well, we simply have a new shogun. He began rebuilding Japan, provided the main ideas for a new constitution, gave women the vote, created basic civil rights, and banned militarism. Suddenly, in June 1950, Communist North Korea sent tanks and infantry surging over the border in a powerful invasion of South Korea. The attack was lightly opposed because the United States had withheld heavy weapons from the Democratic South for fear of their attacking the North. With Russia boycotting the UN to protest Red China's not being seated, they couldn't veto the vote to send United Nations forces to Korea. President Harry Truman supplied American troops without consulting his Congress. MacArthur was placed in command of all UN forces. He's past the prime when all of us are long since retired and putting our feet up. But here he has another opportunity to show the characteristics that he believed in, uh, duty, honor, country. A skeleton US force from Japan was landed. Along with South Korean troops, the outnumbered Americans were driven steadily backward before stabilizing a defensive perimeter around the southern port of Pusan. It would be a long and bloody fight to break out. But now MacArthur envisioned one of the great counterstrokes of modern military history, a flanking amphibious invasion of the enemy-held port of Incheon in the north to trap the forces besieging Pusan. The American Joint Chiefs, who opposed the Incheon invasion plan, flew to Tokyo for a showdown. The UN commander was ready for them. In the meeting that followed, MacArthur would convince them that his battle plan was entirely feasible. The landings at Incheon succeeded brilliantly, and the North Korean army was soon in full flight. Flushed with success, determined to reunify the two Koreas, he now pushed his forces across the dividing 38th parallel, a move fraught with new dangers. As American and South Korean forces rapidly advanced toward the Yalu River border, separating North Korea from Manchuria, MacArthur chose to ignore repeated warnings 
that the Chinese would not tolerate what they saw as an incipient aggression against their country. Now was when he should have heeded the old family battle cry, listen, oh listen. In the early autumn of 1950, with UN forces pressing the North Korean army northward toward Manchuria, worries about Chinese intervention rose sharply. On October 10th, President Truman summoned the UN commander to a mid-Pacific meeting at Wake Island for a first-hand battle report. It was said that Truman disliked the pompous MacArthur and regarded him as a political rival. There he informed the president that intelligence gave no indication that the Chinese were massing for any type of intervention. And indeed, should the Chinese have the temerity to, to attempt to intervene, his air power would make the Yalu run red with their blood. On November 26th, a brilliantly concealed Chinese infiltration exploded into attack as a horde of 300,000 so-called volunteers fell upon MacArthur's force, already deep into North Korea. They hit 8th Army, U.S. 8th Army, on the west coast very hard and forcing it to retreat. Any retreat is not a pretty sight. A fighting withdrawal is never pleasant. 8th Army did manage to pull its way south and still be able to sustain itself in combat. There's no question it was a defeat. It was one of the great defeats of the American army in the 20th century. The aura of the miracle man was gone, along with the old certainty that he could steamroller his demands for a no-holds-barred prosecution of the war without political considerations. He was ordered not to make public policy statements without clearance. He pushed his luck. An increasingly exasperated Truman heard him proposing a blockade of China and the use of nationalist Chinese troops in Korea. His rash action scuttled an armistice attempt. The revelation of MacArthur's rebellious letter to a congressman was Truman's final excuse to act. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. Truman's action was gruff and humiliating. Word came to Japan over the radio. MacArthur had no time to address the Japanese people, but they lined up 10 deep to say goodbye. In the United States, it was greeted by a storm of adulation that stretched from coast to coast. Many believed that his appearance before a joint meeting of Congress was the opening salvo in his bid for a presidential nomination. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just Fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. He traveled the country, criticizing the policies of the administration, claiming that Europe's first line of defense was not the Rhine, but the Yalu. For months, his reception was steadily tumultuous, but then slowly, but very perceptibly, the public's attention began to wane. I think one of the reasons that MacArthur kind of fades away after his initial euphoria is because the, the war drags on so much. It's not ending. I think people get kind of tired of it. Casualties mount, the stalemate, the ongoing truce talks. I think people just become disillusioned with the whole Korean experience. There is little doubt that MacArthur was deeply disappointed at not being swept into the presidential nomination 
as happened to his old rival, Dwight Eisenhower. In fact, he never came close. MacArthur was never a politician, whereas Eisenhower was. You have to remember that during World War II, he had a whole cast of characters that each day was a test of a highly skilled politician's talent, will, and ability. MacArthur simply ruled in his command in the Southwest Pacific area, again, when he was Supreme Commander Allied Powers in Tokyo, and when he was United Nations Commander in Korea. It was MacArthur and his court. No one questioned MacArthur. This might be very good for an emperor, but it's not very good training for a politician. MacArthur's uh, waning years were actually uh, uh, somewhat delightful for him. Uh, he was 72 years old when he came back from the Far East. He lived uh, in a hotel in New York City, often visited West Point, was visited by the high and mighty at a steady procession, and all of his old friends. He became board chairman of Remington Rand, enjoyed his family, and kept up with the world, and would finally say of Harry Truman, the little bastard had the guts to fire me, and I like him. At age 82, MacArthur returned to his beloved West Point to receive an award and to sum up his tumultuous and passionate lifetime for the long gray line at whose end he now stood. This was the return of a legend, General MacArthur returning to West Point to give his farewell address. I remember that day, the 12th of May, 1962, when he came to talk to the Corps of Cadets for the last time. In the evening of my memory, always I come back to West Point. Always there echo and re-echo duty, honor, country. Today marks my final roll call with you. But I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last conscious thoughts will be of the core and the core and the core. Douglas MacArthur died on April 5, 1964, in New York City from the complications of age. He was 84. In a pelting rain, an honor guard of generals and admirals, 2,500 men of West Point, and tens of thousands of citizens honored him to muffled drums and to the bugle calls that had been his first conscious memory. In a turbulent life, that had showered him with a glory as magnificent as he had lavished on his country.